The views expressed on this program do not necessarily reflect those of this station. Welcome to Insights into Northeast Michigan, a WBKB News public affairs program. Insights deals with the issues affecting those in the community, as well as Northeast Michigan and the state. And now, Insights into Northeast Michigan. On this week's edition of Insights, we'll be talking about low lake levels and how they affect us here in the Great Lakes. Today joining me is Margaret Lansing from NOAA, who is an ecologist, and um, we're talking about the big picture here. We talk a lot about, about the rising um, levels and the lowering levels of lake levels. What does that exactly mean? So the Great Lakes do have variable annual cycle. What we're experiencing <clears throat> this year is unprecedented and unprecedented in terms of our recorded lake level record. We saw record, record lows in Lake Michigan and Huron in both December and January of this year. And why are lake levels so important to us here? Well, the Great Lakes rely on this massive system for its economy, um, lar large part of the ecosystem, commerce for navigation. Um, it's big on tourism, transportation, recreation, agriculture. So a drop, a significant drop in lake levels does impact many factors um, that impact the people that live in the region. Mm -hmm. And why is it so important to measure these lake levels? I know you guys at NOAA spend a great majority of your time watching the lake levels. It's important for navigation, for commerce, for recreation. Okay, and with the lower lake levels in the past couple of years, how does that impact us here right now? Right here in northern uh, Lake Huron, Georgian Bay, it's particularly impacted the people who have cottages. They're experiencing particularly low water levels, and uh, so it's imp impacting tourism. It's also impacting the shipping industry because um, when they go through the connecting channels of the Great Lakes, they um, are cutting it so close in terms of the um, loading that um, they're finding that they have to light load their vessels, okay. which means a drop in profits. Right, right. So does that also mean they have to take double? Um, this means more, more frequent trips, mm -hmm. less profit. Mm -hmm. And you guys also do a collaboration, is that right? That's right. So NOAA enjoys partnership in terms of studying the Great Lakes water levels. It partners with the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers and Environment Canada. Okay, and how do those other entities help you guys accomplish your goal? So NOAA conducts the research and monitors the water levels as what, on the U.S. side. Mm -hmm. uh, Environment Canada monitors um, the water levels on the Canadian side because it is a binational resource. And the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers puts out the monthly um, bulletins with the Great Lakes uh, water levels forecast. Okay, so you guys are kind of all working together to monitor the lake levels? That's right. It's really a research to operations type of uh, collaboration. Okay. NOAA's on the research side. Mm -hmm. Okay, and they kind of do the, what side are they on? So the Army Corps does the official monthly lake forecast bulletin. Okay. Okay. And we provide the data for that. NOAA okay. provides the data. And, and on the Canadian side, Environment Canada. Okay, fantastic. And so we were talking about the coastline. How does the coastline um, affect all of this? Well, one of the things that's hard to get a grip on for people who live in the Great Lakes region is how massive they are. Even if you live on the water, mm -hmm. it's just massive. So the U.S. Great Lakes coastline is 4,500 miles. Mm -hmm. If you include the Canadian side, it's 10,000 miles of coastline. And the way that that relates to water levels is infrastructure in terms of the monitoring station. So NOAA has water level monitoring stations on its coastline, okay. and Canada has water level monitoring stations on its side. Mm -hmm. And it's a lot of coastline to cover in terms of monitoring Great Lakes water levels. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, and with such a vast amount of coastline, how are you guys able to monitor them all at the same time? We have a network of stations that we'll be talking further about. We're, we're sitting next to one here in Alpena mm -hmm. by the Thunder Bay River today. Right, right. And so 
What's the big picture that you would say about the lake levels? How does that all intertwine with the Great Lakes that we have here in northern Michigan? The big picture is that NOAA is determined to improve our forecasting on the Great Lakes water levels. What we're finding is there's been a basic regime shift in the water levels and that's why they're lower now. Okay. Um, the basics of why the water levels are low has to do with over lake precipitation, mm -hmm. over lake evaporation and runoff. And that equation is changing. It's a complicated equation. So the big picture is NOAA and other agencies, our partners, we're working hard to understand all the pieces of that equation. Right, right. And talking about that equation, why have we seen, we kind of already went into why we have seen lower lake levels in the past couple of years, but how do you guys monitor those? Are, is it something that you guys um, forecast in advance? Yes, we do have that capability, and one of my colleagues will be talking about that later. Okay. Um, and kind of just to wrap it all up, why is it so important to continue the work that you guys do at NOAA? Well, it's so important um, to understand the Great Lakes water levels for the, com the commerce of the Great Lakes region and the recreation. Forty million people live in the Great Lakes region. They rely on the, uh, water, the water for drinking water as well as recreation and commerce. Okay, fantastic. Well, thank you so much for joining me. And when we come back, we'll talk to Linda Austin, who will talk, uh, talk to us a little bit more about how they monitor the lake levels. Welcome back to Insights. Linda Austin joins me now from NOAA, and you um, have a different view than Margaret. You um, actually take in all the data and um, are in charge of the monitoring stations, correct? And how many stations, I know there's a lot of level monitoring stations um, nationally, how many are there? So nationally there are 210 um, tide and water level monitoring stations. Um, so the difference is outside of the Great Lakes there's tides. Um, along the coastline of the Great Lakes it's water levels. Mm -hmm. But we have a lot here right in Michigan. Right. So within the Great Lakes there's 53 water level stations and in Canada there's ad an additional 33. Okay, and what goes on in these stations? So basically there's pipes that go out into the water that we're measuring um, that provide an intake and it's a regulated still water intake okay. so that when the float goes down and it literally measures where the water is in the gauge station mm -hmm. um, and we can determine um, on six minute intervals how what the water levels are. Wow, and how does it gauge it? What is it in that structure that gauges the water level? So there's actually a series of equipment. Um, it's it's very from a very basic float that sits on top of the water. Okay. And then um, there's electric tape that um, sends a, um, sends electronic files through various equipment back um, from the actual water level station to our offices in Silver Spring, Maryland, where we have. Uh, oceanographers that actually analyze the data and provide it back through the internet to um, the users. Fantastic. And is that something that happens all year round? Yeah, it's, it's a 24-7 operation. We actually have another group of folks that monitor uh, the water levels and when if the data looks like it's out of norm, uh, it, there's a tension call to it and it's analyzed and shut down if it's gone off of line, if a storm has headed and knocked a, a station out or something along those lines. Okay, and how is it affected during storms in winter months when the lake levels are kind of frozen? So there's actually heaters Okay. Um, to, to make sure that doesn't wow, occur and the, the pipes are actually below ice level. Mm -hmm. um, so they're, they're very, um, very created um, to address the, the very dynamic systems in the Great Lakes. Okay, fantastic. And how is all this data used? The data is used in a variety of functions. Um, for uh, Our primary mission is to provide uh, support for the um, navigation purposes mm -hmm. so that the commerce, the um, shipping companies can get their goods in and mm -hmm. turn around and get back out. Um, some additional uses here, um, there's coastal managers that need the information, beach replenishment, um, recreational users dial in and get the data, so kayakers can use it um, because there is a full complement of information that comes from these um, water level stations. And I imagine there's a lot of information that goes along with all this data. How is it used um, for other entities? 
So um, when navigating a ship, um, it's very important, especially in the area of Thunder Bay where shipwrecks are common um, or have been common in the past, um, the improvements by using systems like our phys physical oceanographic real-time system or ports, mm -hmm. um, the ship's cap captains can look and find out how deep the water is so that when they drive their ships in, they don't run aground, they can actually, uh, especially in the Sioux Locks, can really estimate how long they can take to get through a water system um, and time equals money when you're you're bringing in commerce or commercial shipments right definitely and so I mean a large majority of the work that you guys do here is essential for other commodities like we were just saying um, why do you think it's so important to kind of keep this going well I think I think with looking at um, the impacts of what low water levels and how over the years, um, the Great Lakes system is a fluctuating system. And by having uh, a long-term record of what the water levels are, we, can, we have analysts that can look at sea level change, people who um, have properties on the lakes, they're aware of what the water levels are doing. Um, and it's really good for, as a, in a dynamic system like this, to have as much information as possible to provide accurate decision making. And so this information is really um, all allotted to everyone, not just specific ship captains. How do people get this information? So basically, the, there's a variety of ways you can, you can access the data. Um, it's available online. Mm -hmm. um, you can dial into the tidesandcurrents.noaa.gov website. You can also, if you're local here in Alpena, um, you can actually call uh, the phone number um, and it will, you can make your selection and get the data right over the phone. Okay. Um, there's um, an app for ports application. Uh -huh. You can get it on Very your phone. Tech savvy. Yes, we're, we're <laughs> actually um, keeping up with um, good ways to provide the information to the users. Okay, and how often is that data um, refreshed? Um, six minute intervals. Okay. So every six minute, um, the, the local station in Alpena is um, keeping track of the water levels. Okay, fantastic. Well, thank you so much for joining me. And when we come back from the break, we'll talk a little bit more about the research tools involved. Welcome back everyone to Insights. Now, Ann Kleitz from NOAA, who is a physical scientist, joins me now. Thank you for joining me. Thanks, thanks a lot. Thanks. And yeah, definitely. And your um, section of study, the area of study that you do, is more um, related to the different databases, correct? Yeah, I, I'd really like to tell you what we do with the data that, that uh, Linda and Margaret were talking about outside. Um, monitoring Great Lakes um, water levels is an important part of NOAA's mission to understand and predict changes in weather, climate, coasts, and oceans. Mm -hmm. And as Margaret talked about the importance of the amount of coastline we have here in the Great Lakes, it obviously affects a lot of people, uh, how the lakes go up and down. Right. And there's regular cycles. To, there's a lot of natural variability. But our scientists study, really, really study that data in order to better understand those cycles so that they can use that information to improve our models. Uh, forecasting is what NOAA is all about. So it's very important to have this great, long, 150-plus year uh, data record so that we can understand the variability and use it to predict future water levels. Right, and you guys have different tools that you use. Um, one that I'd like to talk about today, um, we, we do a lot of forecast models, a lot of um, models at our lab, but one that I'd like to share with you today that I think a lot of people at home will enjoy bringing up on their computer screen is called the Great Lakes Water Level Dashboard. Okay. Um, it's very easy to use. You can go to our website, to our water levels page and find it pretty, pretty quickly. Mm -hmm. and this actually, imp we're, we're trying to improve access to, to the water level data. There's a lot of data out there, mm -hmm. but we're trying to use this portal to combine a lot of data and forecasts to make it easy for people to get to. Okay. And we know that it's used by a lot of different people, this water level data, but this, this um, tool we're hoping will improve the access. And, and it's very interesting to look at the long 150 plus years of what the levels have done. They've, they've been up, they've been down. Mm -hmm. um, people that have lived here in Alpena a long time know that, but not so much if you get away from the lakes. No, people know less about the variability, but there is a lot of variability. Each year, I'm sure you know if you live here, 
the lakes are low in November, December, January, and then they go back up in the summer and they usually peak out July, August, depending on the weather. That's part of the natural cycle that all the lakes go through. Okay, and so how is this database used um, to illustrate all those different levels? Well, one, one of the interesting things that, that I'm going to show you here is, is a new version of the dashboard that mm -hmm. we're, that's called the Hydroclimate Dashboard. Okay. And it, it makes accessible some really interesting data sets that, we, that our scientists study and have been accumulating for a long time. We can actually overlay precipitation records and evaporation records with lake level, mm -hmm. which kind of, it, it's a very visual thing. You, you can see that interplay because the big drivers for Great Lakes lake, lake levels, the changes that happen every year, the biggest drivers for, the, for that is the evaporation and the precipitation. Mm -hmm. So um, one of the things that our scientists have realized looking at at this interplay in data is that the last 10 to 15 years, the evaporation has greatly outpaced the precipitation. So there's more water leaving right. than coming down. Um, it's pretty simple. Um, and that seems to be uh, a cause of our, our current Low situation. Levels. Yeah, yeah. What I want to plot here is precip minus evaporation. And it's going to bring up some bars. So what are those bars showing? So that's actually showing, so basically the water delivered to the lakes. Okay. So I, I, we've subtracted evaporation, and this is, this is the actual result of precipitation minus evaporation. Okay. And you can one? see the light blue dots are the lake levels. The dark blue bars are, are sort of the water supply delivered to the lakes mm -hmm. that are above average and the tan bars are below average. Mm -hmm. So what I'd like you to look at is on Lake Superior and Michigan Huron in the last 15 years, mm -hmm. just how negative that water signal is, how many tan bars there are. You don't see very many navy blue bars at all. Right. You see a huge one on Lake Erie last year. Lake, Lake Erie had a, a very strange year precipitation-wise last year. But look how negative that, that water supply signal is. And that's what our scientists have been noticing. Look and so through, through this dashboard, anybody is able to see the different um, databases and things. That anybody can bring it up. And we encourage everybody to take a look at it because it's really interesting. And it totally helps tell the story of um, you know, why lake levels are so important if you live in this area um, because there is a lot of variability. And you can see. Uh, we've showed it to people and had them say, oh, yeah, I remember when in the 1960s uh, the levels were really, really low because right. that's the last time they, um, the, the records that we set this past December and January, mm -hmm. we were breaking the records that were set in 1964, 65. Wow. Um, and then in the, the mid-80s they were high. Right. Um, the hardest thing to predict is those decadal mm -hmm. shifts. Mm -hmm. um, those, those are very hard. We, we certainly have people looking at the future and looking at climate models and seeing what's going to happen in the future, but that, there's a lot of uncertainty with those predictions. Okay. So looking, I know it's hard for decades, but looking year to year, mm -hmm. do you guys have tools where you can see for next year, kind of yep. predetermine what the lake levels will be? Every day at our lab we run a model that, that was developed at our lab that looks from one to ten months in the future. Oh, okay. And that's one of the tools that the Corps of Engineers uses in their system. Their, their forecast is the official forecast for the water basin and it's coordinated with Canada. Mm -hmm. but, um, but our model is one of the tools that they use mm -hmm. to, to decide what the forecast is going to be for the next one to six months. Mm -hmm. And we're constantly looking at this data stream to improve the way we forecast mm -hmm. so that we can improve that information for everybody because about February or March, so the hits on our website go sky high because mm -hmm. everybody's wondering, where am I going to set my dock? You know? Right, right, right. So, so we, we do work on that all the time. Okay. So do you guys have any ideas about um, this coming next year? Um, well, right now it looks like for sure Michigan and Huron are going to stay similar to last summer, mm -hmm. really below average. Mm -hmm. And if you look at the dashboard, you can see looking, comparing um, Michigan Huron to the lower lakes, the, the Lake Erie and Lake Ontario right now are right about normal. Okay. They're right about their long-term average, so no big deal down there. 
the story is really up here. Um, Lake Superior isn't quite as extremely low as Michigan Huron. Okay. But um, y you can see, looking at all the, the lake levels together, you can see that it's really a story about the upper lakes. And that seems to be centered on evaporation. Mm -hmm. We're thinking that's the cause. Okay. And so lake levels are also dependent and fluctuate from season to season. Right, right. It's about, depending on what lake you're talking about, it's about a foot to a foot and a half, usually a very natural cycle of low in December, November, December, January, and then peaks out in the late summer, as everybody that has a, a house in Alpena probably knows. <laughs> right, right. And why do we see those different seasonal um, level changes? It's totally about the water cycle. So it's just rain and snow coming, to, it's the cycle of, of, it's the hydrologic cycle. But it's, it's just the timing. Um, for instance, Lake Superior peaks out later because it's such a big lake. It's mm -hmm. such a big drainage area that it takes longer for the snow melt to actually be realized as a lake level. So okay. Lake Superior doesn't usually hit its peak until September. Mm -hmm. But with Michigan and Huron, it may be more like August, a okay. little earlier because it's a little bit smaller. OK, I see. So do you guys predict these things in, um, before every season? Or do you have different tools to predict the levels? We're predicting every day. We're, we're running our model that predicts one to ten months out every day. We, that runs automatically at our lab, and you can bring that up on our, on our website. Um, the Army Corps and Environment Canada that, that issues the official forecast, they do that once a month. Early in the month, they issue their forecast for all the lake levels. Okay. Okay. So. And so for people watching, what can they take away from the lake levels, the different fluctuating levels, and what we talked about with um, the database that they can see at home? Well, I really encourage people to bring it up on, on our website because I think you'll find it really interesting, especially you live up here near the lake. Mm -hmm. um, it's, it's really quite a story. The, the, the whole lake level story is pretty interesting. And we encourage you to, it, it's, it's equally easy to look at the whole 150 years and to, you can um, drag the, the time axis on the dashboard mm -hmm. and you can bring, if you just want to look at the last three years, you can drag it all the way up and just look at recent. So please do that. Please try it out. And um, um, just know that, that this data set that you have a water level gauging station for right here in Alpena Pina is really, really important. And um, that there's a lot of scientists looking at that data and concerned about the Great Lakes. So. All right. Well, thank you so much for joining me. Thanks. All right. Well, that'll wrap up this edition of Insights. You can catch us back here next Sunday. Insights into Northeast Michigan is produced by WBKB News. If you have any comments, suggestions, or topics you would like to see on a future show, please email WBKB News. This has been a production of Thunder Bay Broadcasting Corporation. All rights reserved.